the tablet stroker. I wake up to the urgent sound of knocking on my quarter's door, a sound I have become attuned to these days. Groaning, I pull on a pair of dilapidated sweatpants. I am on call tonight, again. We are only three so far that it tolerates when it goes haywire. The strain is taking its toll. Strange, how life has a way of losing all sense of direction down obscure back alleys. Never in my most dystopic fantasies had I imagined that one day my main assignment would consist in working eight hours shifts seven days a week as an on-call tablet stroker. This is not my actual job description. Dr. Perron, me, was hired at a ridiculously high price for her expertise in computer viruses and microbiomic simulation models. I was recruited a little over two years ago by the JIBE, the Joint International Brain Effort, or rather by the foundation that has taken over administering the outcomes of the project and exploiting their benefits after public funding stopped and, officially, research was brought to a close. The jibe sanctioned discourse is that the main scientific goal of the project, the in silico simulation of a human brain, met with moderate success. The jibe simulation do not work like a brain. Meanwhile, the technological achievements in neuromorphic engineering and cognitive computing have been much publicized and the Jibe Foundation is busy harvesting the patented fruits of these innovations. The reality behind the spin is slightly different. Against all odds, the Jibe has managed to construct a working brain in a silico vat. But its sentience, for lack of a better word, does not come through as remotely human or related to any known terrestrial life form for that matter. It, IT, this is how we call the thing, feels incomprehensibly alien, save for one problematic characteristic. Of all the recognizably human cognitive behaviors that it could have displayed, it has turned out to be severely bipolar, or so we think. It is difficult at the best of times to diagnose and treat bipolar in the flesh humans, despite our long intimate experience with the species. Imagine having to find a therapy for a next-gen hull Arthur C. Clarke never envisioned that one. It took time for the jibe modelers to imagine that they were witnessing a form of mental disorder. None of them was a qualified mental health specialist, even less a computer mood expert. Moreover, they had been modeling a normal human brain, right? They were not overly concerned that the activity levels of their simulation appeared to be cyclical, or that the amplitude between the highs and the lows increased over time. Even when it was at its lowest, they still had an operational simulation that was the best performing cognitive computer, computer ever. At its highest, which was getting steadily higher, its performance was vertiginous, and its designers enjoyed setting it harder and harder challenges. With hindsight, it looks like, as many sufferers of bipolar disorders, it was chasing the highs, and in their ignorance, its minders encouraged this. And of course, chasing the highs precipitated the lows, the imbalance growing ever more serious. It was set on a crash course and eventually hit the wall. During an acute low episode, it tried to commit what for a computer might amount to suicide. It put out of power the entire district where the giant premises were then located and very nearly fried the, new, the nearby nuclear power station. Luckily, the operations team on duty that morning realized quickly enough what was happening and put it to sleep, switching off the computers running it. The job could have scrapped the project there and then, but beside the reluctance to write off the huge investment in time, personnel, and money, there was a temptation to go on reaping the benefits of its milder manic episodes if the depressive ones could be controlled. But it cannot be fed lithium or engaged in cognitive therapies. The Jibes has decided to isolate it. They moved it to an abandoned mine, deep under solid rock, to eliminate rogue wireless communication attempts, and had a dedicated hydroelectric power plant provide its electrical feed. And they assembled a wildly multidisciplinary team crossing over psychiatry, psychology, microbiology, neurology, cognitive neuroscience, complex systems theory, nutrition, 
to try applying to its mood disorder some of the latest research relating the human microbiome with mental health. I was part of the recruits. We have made little progress so far. Early in our efforts, we surmised that the complex overlays of time-varying pattern signals running through its neuromorphic chips could help with the early detection of its mood swings. And to ease surveillance, our computer graphics ways created a wonderful virtual reality visualization of it. It takes the form of an outsized translucent human-like brain, which neuronal activity translates into crawling, sweeping, rushing, intermingling, pulsating waves of multicolored lights. It turns watching it into a mesmerizing experience. We can look at it for hours, entranced, and we have come to wonder whether in return, it monitors our level of attention through its sensors and puts on a show for our benefit. For all we know, this could be it trying to communicate with us. Recently, it has even started reacting to some of us when we caress without apparent meaningful purpose, the tactile screen that we use to interact with it. Low frequency dark crimson frissons run through the simulation, and we have found that delicate rhythmic strokes of this appendage soothe it when its hyperactivity becomes erratic and threatens to spiral out of control. So this is what I do when I am on duty like tonight and there is an alert. I drag myself to the lab, I don the VR headset, and I start stroking the tablet. That's it.